So how are you? I, I'm good. I appreciate you talking to me about this. I thought it was just, it's such a, especially for, you know, someone like me that loves movies, it's so fun to watch something like this. I'm surprised that there hasn't been a movie like this before. <laughs> I know it's true. Right? Other than Cinema Paradiso, there's no movie about our last picture show, but there's no movie about going to the movies. And that's what I always wanted to do. So it's been it's a weird you bring that up because I've had the, the script for a while, the idea for like 15 years. I was terrified that someone was going to do it. That was like that was the terror I had over the years, like someone's going to do something similar, because like you, I thought there was a movie to be mined about cinema, inspiration, the magic of the theater experience. So interesting you said that. When did you make the leap from, you know, having the idea to actually sitting down to write it? God, I think it was, I think it was after Purge 2, I think. I think I felt, low. Oh, I was happy with where Purge 2 came out. I had the idea and everything felt kind of right there. I was like, oh, maybe I can, maybe the financing will come. I know it's, it's much harder to get financing for a small personal film than something like Purge, which is a, you know, genre movie. So I felt like, oh, maybe the, the success of the Purges will help me find the financing for This Is The Night, which was back then called The Night Rocky Three opened, and then it became Once Upon a Time in Staten Island, and then This Is The Night. So it's had its chi- title changes. But yeah, I think it was after Purge 2 where I sat down, wrote it, and, uh, and then showed Sebastian and Jason, and luckily they liked it, and here we are. I-, I love that you've done enough Purge movies, and you've done them for long enough that you can just judge them by which purge movie you did and you know tell me like oh i did this after this purge because right exactly exactly yeah this happened it's, it's, been, it's been like i think it's only been nine years of the purge so i remember like every break i had in between them i'm like okay i wrote a book at one point two books actually in the time period several scripts but this was the big thing that i wanted to get done during this kind of pur- the purge decade of my life it, your love of cinema is obvious. Was it always Rocky Three that you wanted to base this around? Did you ever consider any other films? Did it always have to be this one? It was from the seed. It was always Rocky Three because I think Rocky Three. I, I always attributed it to be being that this was in a, such an Italian and American neighborhood. It really the Rocky character was so beloved here that I think the mythology of Rocky had built up this, this crescendo by Rocky Three that it really was this event. Everybody was going. We waited three, three and a half hours online. We saw it twice in two days. It, it inspired everything from people wanting to do good things to guys fighting over seats. It was really this event that the whole <laughs> kids were holding the poster in school. It was really crazy. And I think it was because of one and two were so beloved. But then I spoke to people from other parts of the country and it was equally as an event, I think. And that's what, so I was wrong. It wasn't just the Italian American nature. There was something I think about the Rocky character that people found, you know, he was beloved across across ethnicities. and uh, But the only time we considered another film was, at, so I never did in the writing stage or the seed of the idea. I always wanted, well, two things. I always wanted the movie at some point, as you could see in the movie, I don't show scenes from Rocky Three during the screening. I purposefully didn't show Rocky Three because at some point I wanted it to be more of a, a metaphor for any movie that you could be watching. So I was like, oh, I don't want to show. And then I got a lot of notes saying, no, no, you should show Rocky three. Let's show more. Even Stallone said, James, show some scenes from Rocky three. And then we tried the edit to do that. And it changed the whole nature of the sequence. It became about watching Rocky three. You get caught up in Rocky three, which was bad. I mean, it's like, no, no, there's another movie playing. So don't watch Rocky three. But it also took the, it, I wanted it to be about the emotional experience of the audience and it changed that. So, but then at some point, so that was one thing, but at some point, there was a rights issue that we confronted. Someone was afraid that we weren't going to get the rights to show the imagery from Rocky three, I think from UA or MG, UA MGM. And uh, they said, James, it's a good script. Can you substitute another movie that would create such a event and create this night of inspiration and courage? And I, I was hard pressed to find anything. I said, I wanted to, I, did, I was very saddened by this, that we couldn't get the rights at the time. Luckily we did. And everybody was so cool at UA MGM. And they read the script and they were very happy to give us the rights. Uh, to use Rocky's imagery. So I thought about it. Somebody said Karate Kid. I'm like, no, that doesn't work. Godfather was a big, the Godfather was a very big thing here in Staten Island, but it didn't feel right that people would be inspired by the Godfather. <laughs> you know, I don't think people cheer during the Godfather films. They're an event, but people aren't cheering. So, so yeah, it never, long answer. No, not really. Did we ever consider anything else? I, I love to just the fun of watching them all waiting in line and having to actually buy the tickets in person because yeah, I, <laughs> I used to do that a lot with concert tickets, but it's just that, yes. that alone is such a rare thing. Oh, well, that's what, you know, 
ultimately what I'm trying to talk to my love of film, my love of movies and but also about the theatrical experience. And I like that you bring waiting in line because I think that's part of what makes it so special is we wait, we're anticipating something, we're driving somewhere, we're getting canned food, where there's a long line sometimes. I think losing all that, you just can't, rep- you can't replicate it at home. And that's what makes me so sad moving into the future. As we see the theater experience, we're being told might go away eventually, which terrifies me. So I hope this is not an artifact from a time that's forgotten. I hope that somehow, I think people will return to the cinemas. I have hope that things will return to a good, you know, uh, uh, time where people wanted to sit, you know, get out of their houses after COVID. I think it's happening already, but yeah, I was, I think that's part of it, driving, waiting online. And I haven't done that either. We buy all our tickets online now. So we lose part of that experience, which, you know, I hold dear. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because you don't even have to try to wait for a seat that you want anymore because seats Absolutely, are assigned. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. It's just like all the little things you're reminded <laughs> yeah. of that aren't part of the experience anymore. Exactly. It's, uh, yeah, no one fights over seats anymore. We used to fight people, especially Rocky movies. People were punching each other to get good seats. No, it's true. All those little things. Even I tried to do something where even spoilers, I think, are much different now, how we deal with spoilers. So in the beginning of the movie, the boys are talking about, is someone going to die in the film? Maybe there was a rumor. So now we'd probably be able to, we probably heard who's going to die going into a film. Yeah. We can read about it. Now, back then, it was much more mysterious. You know, We heard this rumor. Is it true? So I think there's less mystery, too, because of so much information out there that we can have access to. So everything's changed. But... uh. I hope that the experience doesn't change that much. I hope that the theater is always there because, again, you, it's never as immersive anywhere else. This movie is very different from the Purge franchise, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. most people would probably be shocked to learn it's the same person that you know yeah. created yeah. both of these things. Did you write this at a time when you needed something different for yourself? I mean, were you looking for something just to really even just cleanse the palate of yes. the purge. <laughs> yes. I always say this was me purging the purge. Like this is my way. And then I went back and purged after this again. But it, I always, I also call the movies oddly. I always say it's the good feel purge because the purge inspires people to do very bad things. The most dastardly things in the world, right? Murdering someone. Whereas I think Rocky and movies I'm saying inspire people to be better versions of themselves. So it's my anti purge film. It's go out and be courageous and fight your fears in a good way. So no, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I needed something that, uh, I love every kind of film. I know there's certain, I guess, filmmakers who are set into making just one genre. Uh, but I'd love to just, I'd love to cross genres. I like to cross genres in the same film, which a lot of people yell at me for, and I know they don't like. So as you can see, there's many tonal, <laughs> there's tonal changes in this film all over the place, which I love, but I know it's, it's a personal thing that I know uh, other people don't, but yeah, I love, it was a way to definitely do something different. I hope I can continue to do different things. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I've always kind of been in the mindset where, you know, genre doesn't matter if it's a really great story and great characters right. and the actors do a great job with the material. Yeah, It's why I always find it so weird when people are like, oh, I hate horror. Oh, I hate comedy. Or It's like right. you, you just haven't seen one that you identify with. Absolutely. Yeah. Just find a good one. You'll love it. <laughs> It'll change yeah. everything you think about that genre. And uh, yeah, so that's a, and I love I love movies that mix up genres. It's hard to find, but you see a lot of European cinema. Japanese cinema too, but uh, I tried to do that to, that here where it's, you know, we got absurdity, we got comedy, we got melodrama, we got hard drama. So yeah, I love it. I love all the different genres. It, it's so interesting too, looking at your movies, because this does feel like a film that's closer to the first film you did than obviously to the Purge films. Yes. Did it feel at all like a return to your roots as a filmmaker? Or does it feel like this might have been the next movie you had made if you hadn't done the Purge? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's what's so weird when people, so I'm so happy you, you're even aware of my first film, uh, Staten yeah. Island, New York with Ethan Hawke and Vincent D'Onofrio. Uh, because I, mean, I would say- Who wouldn't be aware of that team up? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. It's a great team up. Uh, they are amazing. I always wanted to write a TV show for the two of them because they're wonderful people too. But yeah, I think that movie and, and Rocky Three or The Night Three Opened or This Is The Night are directly correlated in a way uh, or connected, I should say. Whereas The Purge then pops out in between. So people say, oh, this doesn't seem like you. I'm like, oh, you probably haven't seen my first film. So I'm so happy you saw it. You know, it's a, it's a, I, I find it a very interesting film. So yeah, I felt like I was, it was nice to know I could do it again. Meaning that, because you worry as a filmmaker that am I going to get locked in and I'm only going to, people are only going to want X from me from now on. It's a terror, you know, I'm privileged to make films and I continue making horror, thriller, dystopian action films, whatever The Purge is considered. But I, you want to try different things. So 
it was very nice to be able to return to this kind of genre, not non-genre, even though there's some genre, a little crime in there, I guess, maybe a little tiny bit of crime genre in, in This Is The Night, but it was nice to return to something different, yeah. Do you ever wish that you had directed all of the Purge films yourself just to say that you directed them all? or I did all. <laughs> Or do you feel like it made the franchise fresh for you again to see what other filmmakers brought to it? It's a great question. It's great because I think about it too, like, oh, should I have stayed and just did all five? And But I don't think, I had fatigue on directing it, definitely. I was ready to, you know, move on, do this film. and But I also think that because of the nature of what four and five became, uh, you know, I was really being inspired by the events of the country when four or five were written, even more than the previous three. The DNA of the socio-political landscape seeped into the writing. It was inevitable because they are political conceits, the purges of political conceits. So everything that was starting to happen in our country with the state of discord and dissonance amongst political parties and people seeped its way in. So, and then hiring, I think, diverse directors such as Gerard and Everardo for the films, I think actually it, it, it elevated them in a way that I alone couldn't have done. So sometimes I think, oh, maybe I should have stayed on and just had this, you know, these five films that I wrote and directed, how cool. But I think they actually made it better than I would have done. and. I think they brought out the socio-political nature. I might have stayed more genre-based. Uh, so yeah. So uh, and then maybe maybe it's also given me enough time away that I might return for six. We're actually talking about that now. So I think if I didn't step away, I would have definitively walked. I would be so purge fatigued. So <laughs> were there things that you learned from uh, learned about directing from making the purge movies that you feel you carried over to doing this film that influenced this film in any way? Yeah, definitely. The Purge films are, they're incredibly, and as Jason knows this, so it's nothing against Jason, but the, the model is to do it cheaply, but make it look like a $50 million film that's going to be released on July 4th. But you don't have 50 million, you don't have near 50 yeah. <laughs> So, So it's very hard. It really becomes incredible. And I know, listen, I'm not complaining. I love making films, but even me than, more than me, the crew, by the middle of these movies, were shooting all nights. Usually a Purge film was all night other than five, which I wasn't directing. So I wasn't privy to the day Purge shooting. All nights not much time and we're really fatigued by it all so so but you start to figure out how to work within those parameters and suddenly which actually sebastian and i joking uh, always joke around like we're almost we've been beaten down to figure out how to work for with no budgets <laughs> at this point you just start to figure out well how can we make look, something look great if you have the right people on such a small budget and it was the same thing on rocky three i knew i wanted to make a it has a magical feel so i knew it had to have a certain look which that kind of look is not easy to do on the time allotted but since our DP, Anastas Mikos, worked on Purge 4 and also the reshoots for Purge 3, uh, and he was doing this as a night, I think we adopted the kind of fast but non-compromising way to give it a specific look that we learned from doing it. If I hadn't done the Purge and learned all the tricks of the trade on how to move quickly but not compromise, I don't think we would have been able to, because This Is Night was even smaller than those films, but it was quite ambitious in scope. Yeah. So so we learned a lot, brought it to, the, brought it to This Is a Night. How hard, it, how hard was it to assemble your young cast and to find actors who could really embody this era and make it feel real and authentic when they hadn't lived it? Yeah, great question. So we waited. We made a deal, Sebastian, Jason, and I, when, we, uh, when Jason said, okay, we're going, but let's make a deal. If we can't find the right boys, let's not make it. Like we have to feel good about that because that's the heart and soul of the movie. So it took a while because I also had the specific thing. I, they had to feel authentic to the 80s. Like you said, they also had to feel authentic to New York, Staten Island. But I also didn't want to play into the cliches that I've seen so many times with the, the heavy accents, which is definitely here, but it's not always here. It's somewhat of a cliche. It's, it's overblown, in my opinion, in, in movies and TV. So it was about finding someone that's believable in New York without being the cliche. And it was tough because we met great actors whose accents were, I felt, a little too thick. And I wanted the movie to have not just such a provincial feel, something a little more universal. Maybe this could be anywhere. Yes, I'm saying Staten Island. but maybe it could feel like your hometown. So it was that really fine line, but it took, it took about a year to get the three boys. But once we got them, we felt great. And we moved on to the, the, the bigger, the bigger names in the case. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I love Frank Grillo and yeah. Naomi Watts in this. I, I, I think they're both so great in it and they really are playing characters that we're not really used to seeing from them. Both yeah. of them. I mean, Frank, obviously, but even with Naomi and, what was it that made you think of them? And did you need to do any convincing of them to take on characters like this? No, luckily, no, that, that was great. So I didn't have to really do much of a sell, especially with both of them, actually. Frank, 
I had gotten pushed from certain people in the process to cast him as the mobster, which I didn't want to do. I was like, that seems the easy choice. Let's give, I know Frank could do it. Frank's an amazing actor, everybody knows that, but he also could be quite vulnerable. I think we know him as this hyper masculine, tough guy. I was like, what's interesting is to see that hyper masculine guy kind of in the subordinate role with this mobster who's dominating because of financial reasons and, and their past over with the love triangle with the wife. So I thought that was interesting to put Frank in this vulnerable position. And I thought he rose to the occasion. I knew he could do it. We had done a mini series together that I had wrote in God, 2005, where I saw him be very vulnerable. So I knew he had it. It's called kill point and he's wonderful in it. So we had, so Frank was, he was excited to try something different too, because he thought he would be off at the mobster when he got the script. And then Naomi was just one of those. I still can't believe it. I saw a list of names. They gave me a list and they were like, well, who do you want? My favorite actor on the list was Naomi. I'm like, oh, she's my favorite actor. She's the best. But I, I was, to me, it was a ridiculous idea. I'm like, well, we have a couple of months. Let's take one big shot. Let's take one insane shot. It's probably going to be a no. Then we'll make a move to someone else that's more realistic. And Jason kind of knew Naomi through, I think, some somewhere back in the day when he was working at Miramax. And he sent through the script. And within a week and a half, I was sitting with her in Manhattan. And, and we hit it off. She loved the script. Something touched her about it. And that was it. Now I was making a movie with Naomi Watts. He was the best actor I've ever worked with. So it was it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were so great in it. I mean, I I, yeah. I was such a huge fan of Kingdom and Frank's work in that yes. show. Yes. yes. And he does have such a huge range in that show. Yeah. But still different. This was still different. The yeah the relationship between this family was still different than anything I've seen him do. Yeah, it was and I think he enjoyed doing something different. And uh he had just come off doing uh the Joe Carnahan film, Boss Level. So he was quite muscular. So we had to put him in a lot of baggy clothes. I don't know if you noticed that. So that was kind of, but he liked it. He's like, oh, look, I don't know if people could see my big muscles. So, um, but it was definitely, yeah, he just brought something different. I still can, when I watch it to this day, I'm like, it's cool. so great to see that vulnerable face, especially at the end when you see him kind of break and acquiesce to his wife in that final sequence. I, I find it very touching to see someone that tough. Because that's the great thing about Frank. Why I keep casting Frank is not only is he a wonderful actor, he actually is authentically a tough guy. You don't want to mess with Frank Grillo. That's a very yeah. hard thing to find. He's not acting tough. So that's a great thing. Very rare. We used to get that back in the day with like Lee Marvin and Charles Bronson. And it's, it's kind of rare now, but that, I think we get it with Frank. That's why people love him. I, I know that you have written the next Purge film and that yes. the plan is to bring Frank back, his yep. character back for that. <laughs> yeah. Where did writing this purge start for you was it knowing that you wanted to bring him back and then you developed an idea around that or did you come up with an idea and think okay he could fit into this that's the one yeah yeah it was definitely i was i was done again i said this before i know people say oh demonically you're a liar but i was truly done like i mean that i was like five it's the end of america at the end of five i felt like that was a cool way to kind of end maybe with a little hope that people will fight back but it was kind of not to give away the ending of further purge but it was kind of the end of the america as we knew it as america as we knew it so I was finished, and then I, around, I guess it was around January, with all the craziness happening in Washington on January 6th, I woke up a couple of weeks later, and I had this idea. I couldn't believe it. I was actually shocked. I'm like, oh, I have an idea. I think it's, and I'm like, oh, maybe it's not good, though. I was kind of hoping it wasn't good, because I was done. I was finished with the purge. And uh, I pictured to Sebastian LaMercia, my producing partner, and he loved it. He was mad at me, too. He's like, oh, God damn it, DeMonico. Come on, you're bringing this right back in, just when we thought we were out. So we pictured to Jason. He loved it. Peter Kramer at the studio loved it. So. I went off, I wrote it, and uh, it seems everybody's happy with the script, but we're not green, we're not green. Oh, and then, so to get back to your question, Christina, yeah. So it was the concept first of this kind of new America that had been, not to give away too much, but it was a new face of America broken down to very strong tribal lines that we enter into 10 years after the Forever Purge. So it's been remapped in a way. And then, but it was, as soon as I came up with the lead character, it was just, it was Frank. So it was like, I had the the world and then I was like, oh, this is where, where's Leo Barnes now in this world? And that then it all just naturally fit into place because I, we, Frank and I always said, if we were going to do a sixth one, let's do it together. Which would be fun. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that is a character that's always sort of felt like he hasn't fully had the ending yeah. of his story yet. Exactly, we need to end. So I think it's I think it's a strong ending. So we'll see if, if the if the studio wants it, if the audience wants it, I think, uh, I think we'll know soon, hopefully. We haven't heard yet, so. Yeah, I mean, having written another purge film now do you have more of a sense of the end of the purge now or do you have less of a sense of the end like do you have another idea <laughs> no 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 i do not I, i'm gonna say it again i no way no but i i don't i do but it's weird because sebastian now that in a weird way it's we're calling this like chapter two it's such a different now landscape we're entering into that i guess there could be more 
I'll probably say once again, this is definitively, definitively my last one, but I woke up, I, I said that on five. So now I sound like an idiot just saying it. So, um, but I see this as my end. I do think that the conceit of the sixth one can lends itself to being more. I just, I always worry that I never want the idea to become exploitative, which it could be. So I do worry about that. I want to make sure it's, it's handled well. So even if I'm not writing and directing it, I think Sebastian and I will always stay stay in the orbit of the purge world to make sure it doesn't veer into a strange place. It, it's just been such an interesting franchise to watch because the directions it's taken between, you know, the first movies and then doing films like the first purge and, and even the forever purge and doing the TV show where you explore different areas. Yeah. It's just been such an interesting franchise to watch because it, it sort of allowed you to tell different stories in a way that a lot of other franchises can't, even if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah it's not bound. We always said what's good about it is we're not bound. I should say this. What's, it's not good. You're not bound to a character coming back. We love Leo, so we want him to come back. But it's actually more, it's individual stories. The Purge allows it to go beyond just, oh, this character. Like a rock, the Rocky franchise needs Rocky. I mean, now they have Adonis that they can continue with in Creed, but... So certain franchises are based on those characters. Fast and the Furious, you need the Vin Diesel character. Uh, so this is not bound to that. We just need the conceit. The conceit just allows us to keep diving into the American landscape. And maybe beyond that at some point, I've always wanted to see the purge. You know, I always say the the American culture travels around the world. I would imagine in this dystopian version of America, of in the world, the purge would start traveling potentially to other countries as a conceit that maybe as it, they're selling it in America works. So maybe eventually we'll see it go overseas somewhere. But yeah, it, it, it lends itself to new stories every day. So I, I know you've said that This Is The Night has is a very autobiographical film in, in different ways yeah. for you. Would you say that there's a piece of you or your own family and every character? Is there one character that's entirely a fictional invention? Yeah, I'd say if someone... I'm, I would say I'm Anthony. Anthony's me, the love of film, the love of the experience, the, the age was dissimilar when I saw the film. So Anthony, and then going to a Sweet 16, I didn't go on that night, but the movie kind of inspired me to make a strong move on the girl I loved at the time. It didn't work out the way it does for Anthony. So that's changed. But uh, but I'd say the dad is representative of the, the hyper-masculine males that I grew up with, brothers, uncles, fathers of friends. My dad's luckily a very open-minded liberal thinking forward thinking man a wonderful loving man so not that frank's not but he had more of a, ma a hyper masculinity that my dad was just more of an open-minded guy the christian character people ask me about the most that's based without obviously giving away a name on someone i grew up with who was struggling with their sexual identity in 1982 staten island which was a, what now looking back upon it i keep using the word hyper masculine but the hyper masculine society to be dealing with that issue at that time here it was just profoundly difficult. Not that I'm saying it's not difficult in other places, but here, I uh, and even when he came out to me, he would say that, I, how can I ever tell anyone who I am? And I didn't even know. I was very confused at that age too. So when I conceived of, and he always, this person I knew and knew very well, still know, he found solace in movies, TV, and books as his way. So he has nothing else. There was no other place to, there was no internet. There was no way to find out who he was and people like him. So he was really locked off on this end of the, the island. And even Manhattan at that time seemed a hundred miles, seemed a million miles away, even though it's so close. But when we were young, it seemed very far. So the idea that he always sought solace and found uh, something in art, books, TV, movies, whatever it was, when I told him about this storyline, he loved that I was applying his, his uh, blooming and, and coming out with who he was later in life. It took him years to do that. He, he loved that I was putting it in the context of film. He thought that was very interesting. He, he took, that's what happened in a way with him. Film just was something that he found great solace in. Yeah, I thought that was such an interesting character exploration because, I mean, it's just the time period. There weren't even, yeah. people didn't even have words for things that they have words for now. So exactly. that's what I always said. Exactly. They didn't, there was no labels. There was no names of who am I? What am I? Now there's words. There's ways to identify. Okay. I'm, and that, that's a great thing. Back then there was nothing. And he was quite, he was very isolated. Even I, my response for um to him i think wasn't probably proper i i was trying to be supportive but i was very confused too because i did had 1982 staten island this was unheard of uh so yeah so it was uh it was it was just a time really i think put him in a box that he did not know how to get out of and that's what i wanted to portray here and it's a magical evening so the events that christian goes through 
on this night, obviously compressed in time in a way that would have taken him years in real life. He's dealing with it in one magical evening. So, yeah. but that's, that's the nature of the film, I guess. Yeah. When it comes to this film, what are you most proud of having accomplished with it? I guess it's weird. It's a great question. Christine, because I watched it for the first time. I went to the theater to the Angelica to watch it with friends and family the other night. And, and it felt like my childhood. That's what I finally said. I was, I had the distance enough to, because you get so caught up in these things, they become an obsession to the point of, am I really seeing my film the way it should be seen? Because I'm so close to it. So it's so hard to see your film. Like, right. Even though you watch it twice a week, you're editing it, you're watching it every day, but I would always screen twice a week uh, just to get the overall feel. And then finally, distance allowed me to really watch it. And I was sitting there going, oh, it feels like when I, it feels like 1982 Staten Island. And that, that I felt great about. I left there feeling kind of euphoric, like, wow, that felt like me and the guys running from the bullies in the neighborhood for whatever reason it was, or kissing my first girl at Legends Bar where we actually shot that scene. So it really captured that, the music and the feeling. And it, I think it captured for me that what I feel in the theater experience can be this magical place. I know it's done in this operatic, very poetic way in the screening of Rocky, but I've had experiences similar during Rocky and other movies that felt as magical. So I think I, I think I got that scene right for myself. I can't say for others, but so I felt I felt proud of those two things. Yeah, it's just it's such a fun movie to watch. It's fun and oh, it's sweet so and it makes you feel good and it feels so funny yeah. to say those things from the guy who created the purge. Yes. But... <laughs> <laughs> I know. I purge the purge. I make people feel good, not hard. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, but you deserve the descriptions. I mean the movie does. Yes. It is very it's it just I was surprised at what a smile it put on my face because it does oh, give great. you Thank it gives you. you this feeling of nostalgia in so many different ways. That's great. That I just that's I really one. <laughs> I enjoyed that so much. Great. Thank you. It means a lot, honestly. Yeah, it was a fun one to make. And I just hope people so I think we need I need we need to feel good right now too. I think it's something that I tell people like you want to feel it, it makes you feel good, which usually I can't say that for a purge film. So you can leave that with a smile on your face. So I hope people I hope people get to see it now. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up then, is there is there another script aside from the purge or an idea that's uh, brewing that's very yeah. different that you want to try to take a stab at next? Well, yeah, the next one, which I'm doing a write, uh, rewrite right now on is, um, I don't know if I told you about this last time we spoke. It, I hope it's the next one to go. It looks like it could be. Is uh, It's it's horror. I'd say it's definitely, it's actually more horror, I would say, than The Purge. Of a true horror fans, I'd say it's more horror genre. It's, I would say it's psychological horror. It's a uh, paranoid thriller horror. But it's with uh, Pete Davidson. It's going to look like he's going to star. Pete's attached, uh, who's a friend of mine, lives up the street here in Staten Island. And yeah, we're hoping to shoot in the new year where we just finished drafts. We've shown some people there's interest. So with Pete, I think it's a great role for Pete. It's a very serious role. And that looks like it'll be next. I have a couple other things brewing, but nothing that seems like the closest one to happening. With Pete, I mean, he's somebody that we've seen a bit of acting from, but we haven't yeah. seen a ton of projects from him. What have right. you seen in him that makes you think he's right for it? I saw, when I saw him in... Uh, big time adolescence first. And I've known Pete. Pete's been a Purge fan. And we got introduced with Staten Island guys. So we got introduced from a local restaurateur who's a friend. So you guys were hit it off. And we met one night at the bar, the restaurant. And we got to know him. he was a big Purge guy. We actually started writing a script together. So I got to know him as a, as a human, as a human being, as a person first <laughs> before just an actor. And uh, he's a great guy. And then I had started seeing his work in, I'd seen him on Saturday Night Live, obviously, like everybody else. And then big time adolescence really blew me away. I was like, wow, this is an interesting character. It's not Pete. It's not that guy I know at all. Pete's a good, like, that character's a little aloof. He's a little always jokey. He's a little smart -assed. Pete's got that, but Pete's got a whole other dimension. And then I saw a lot of that in King of Staten Island, and that blew me away. I thought that he had amazing moments, especially when he's alone in that movie. In my movie's a, in the home. That's the one we might do together. He's alone quite a lot. Um, and those two, I guess, those two, seeing them back to back, big time, then King of Staten Island was like, oh, there's something here that I think Pete, Pete, feels right he read it he felt good too and uh yeah so that's it so i hope that makes sense i think so i think it's wonderful <laughs> well i appreciate you talking to me again no christina thank you so much i love talking so anytime we talk about other things <laughs> thank you so much